Our next topic is a group of lectures on memory, cognition, and motivational research. And the first of the speakers today is Larry Squire. Uh, Larry was one of the few people who was here when I got here. I, or did you come? I came in 71. You came about the same time or perhaps a little bit earlier. Which? 70. He beats me at everything. He was here at 70. No, really, very impressive. Uh, and he is a distinguished professor of psychiatry, neurology, and psychology. He's a career scientist at the VA, one of the few, basically, who, are, who, who have this kind of uh, situation where uh, they're there for research uh, and valued for the research that they do. He sent. He sp he's spent his entire career with us. Lucky us. We almost list, We almost lost you to Stony Brook, which would have been just uh, a disaster for us. Uh, he he does research, and I would say probably the premier research in the world on organization and neurobiological foundation of memory. Uh, works with humans, non-human primates, and rodents and has uh, too many awards for me to have the time to talk about. Uh, today, uh, he will be giving us a lecture on cognitive neuroscience of memory. So, Larry, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mark. In 1968, I was a uh, postdoc at Albert Einstein Medical School, and as an extra activity, I began collaborating with an associate professor there named Sam Berendus. That's what Sam looked like at that time. <laughs> and he was studying inhibitors of protein synthesis and memory in mice. And when Sam had the opportunity to move to UCSD, he invited me to join him, and I did in 1970. We worked together for three years, publishing eight papers. And in 1973, I was able to set up my own program and as it turned out, out of stubbornness and luck, I remained here, initially with the support of Arnold Mandel and later on over the long term with the unwavering support of Lou Judd. It's been a wonderful place to have a career. I was always interested in memory and in basic science questions about its structure, its organization, about it, its anatomy, and the function of brain systems important for memory. My background with rats and mice and humans encouraged me to view it as a mam mammalian problem, and that's how it developed, beginning with studies of human memory impairment following electroconvulsive therapy and later patients with neurological injured, injured disease where the strategy, like in much of biology, is to study errors or dysfunction as a window onto the organization of normal function. This work has continued to the present and has involved outstanding collaborators like Christine Smith, for the past 16 years, now on our faculty with her own funding. I also had a program with non-human primates beginning in 1980 for 20 years with Stuart Zola, who became professor in our department, and a rodent program beginning in 1998 for another 20 years with Bob Clark, who also became professor in our department. In the time available, I'd like to tell you a couple things we've learned. First was a problem that arose in 1957 when Brenda Milner, you might say the incomparable Brenda Milner, who turned 100 last summer, when she described in 1957 the profound effect on memory of bilateral medial temporal lobe resection, which was carried out to relieve severe epilepsy in a patient who became famously known as HM. This drawing at midline shows the location of the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the underlying cortex along the parahippocampal gyrus that was, moved, that was removed bilaterally in HM. And at the time, it wasn't known what damage within this large expansive tissue was the tissue, was the damage that explained his memory impairment, although there was a lot of thought that the hippocampus might be important. Once an animal model of human memory impairment was developed in the non-human primate in the, 19, in the late 1970s, it became possible to ask what damage within this large territory is responsible for HM's memory impairment. That is, in effect, we're asking 
What are the structures important for memory? Stuart and I worked on this. We knew it was a solvable problem, and it took 12 years to identify the anatomical components of what we now call the medial temporal lobe memory system. 1991. This slide shows that the uh, hippocampus itself is important. These are the normal animals showing forgetting across the 40 minute delay. This is the, uh, the finding with the hip lesions of the hippocampus itself. But notice that the large HM-like lesion that includes not just the hippocampus, but also the amygdala and the subcortical, the subjacent cortex, has a, produces an even uh, more severe impairment. So what accounts for the additional impairment? Is it the amygdala or is it the underlying cortex? This next slide shows some of the key findings that answered this question. These are the, uh, the normal monkeys. These are the amygdala lesioned animals who have no impairment at all. These are animals, H plus A animals, are animals with hippocampal lesions plus lesions immediately, le cortical lesions immediately below the hippocampus that is necessarily damaged as one uses a surgical approach to approach the hippocampus. But notice that when that lesion is extended forward, to involve the amygdala, it doesn't exacerbate that effect. But when the lesion is brought forward to include the, subcort the subjacent cortex, then one gets the, the uh, severe impairment. So this and other data then pointed to the importance of the cortex subjacent to the hippocampus, namely the entorhinal cortex and the parahippocampal cortex and the perirhinal cortex. So in the end, we could summarize what was learned in three statements using this uh, schematic diagram of the anatomical connectivity among this region, which includes the hippocampal region, the CA fields, the subiculum, and the dentate gyrus, as well as the anatomically adjacent and connected entorhinal cortex, perirhinal cortex, and perihippocampal cortex. And the three statements are that the hippocampus damage, hippocampal damage alone is sufficient to cause a memory impairment and a clinically significant and readily, readily detectable memory impairment. Secondly, the amygdala is not a part of this memory system. It's important for other things like emotional memory, but it's not important for simple remembering. And third, what, we, what was new and what required even new neuroanatomical work, some of it carried out by Wendy Suzuki, a graduate student of ours at the time, and David Amaral, uh, outstanding anatomist and collaborator in many of these studies. What was new is the fact that this cortex adjacent to the hippocampus is also important for memory. And the damage to the hippocampus plus damage to the subjacent cortex is the damage that's responsible for HM's memory impairment. And here then one can see the location of this, this, this uh, system in the three species that have been prominent in this tradition of work namely the human brain, the monkey brain, and the rodent brain, which I think can also stand in for the mouse brain. And what only uh, one has to just keep in mind that the terminology is different in the rodent than it is in the monkey and the human, and that what's called perihippocampal cortex in the human and the monkey is known as post-rhinal cortex in the rat. Well, perhaps it did not escape your notice that it took a very long time for initial, uh, from the initial reports of HM's profound amnesia to the successful development of an animal, mo animal model of HM's mem memory impairment in the monkey and in the rodent. Depending on how one counts, it took 20 to 25 years. The reason it took so long is not because people weren't working on the problem, but because the very nature of HM's memory impairment was misunderstood. In fact, it turned out that the memory impairment following hippocampal damage or more extensive medial temporal lobe damage is much narrower than originally supposed, affecting only a particular kind of memory, what we call declarative memory. And learning and memory are fully intact in a wide variety of task situations. Working with my first graduate student, Neil Cohen, we had the good fortune of discovering the first hint of this in a task of perceptual skill learning. The task is to simply read these three words. 
hard to pronounce, but uh, one simply times how long it takes to read the uh, three words. There's 50 trials a day, and eventually one gets better at this task and get, requires a skill of reading these words backwards. There's a mere reverse print, hypnotic, apocalypse, functional. And what one sees in these three different types of amnesic patients, one starts, it takes about a minute to, initially to read the uh, words. There's 50 trials a day, over three days one gets a lot better, and even three months later one retains the skill, although some of the patients they don't even remember that they've been tested before. So this uh, finding led to a principal distinction between two kinds of memory. In the, in the title, Dissociation of Knowing How and Knowing That refers to a dis famous distinction introduced by Gilbert, the British philosopher Gilbert Ryle in 1942. But the distinction that we, be, we uh, turned to was the distinction between declarative and non-declarative memory, a distinction, a, a terminology that originated in the artificial intelligence literature. Declarative memory refers to conscious memory for facts and events. It's what we mean by memory when we use the term in everyday language. It refers to conscious memory for facts and events as expressed through recollection. And it depends on the integrity of these medial temporal lobe structures that we identified. Non-declarative memory refers to unconscious memory as expressed through performance in the form of skills, habits, conditioning, and the phenomenon of priming. Let me give you another example of this kind of distinction that comes from work that we did with the monkeys. This is the object recognition task referred to earlier, known as delayed non-matching to sample. What happens in this task is that the animal first confronts an object, which the, which the animal displaces to obtain a racing reward, thereby guaranteeing the animal's attention to the stimulus, to the object. Then the screen comes down, the objects are rearranged, and delayed on matching the sample, the animal is then confronted with the old object and a new object, and to obtain a reward, the animal picks the new object, thereby indicating to the experimenter that the animal remembers the other object, having seen it before. So this is task number one. Task number, one. Task number two is a motor skill task in which the animal confronts a, a lifesaver that's been threaded onto a metal tube. The animal can play with the, the candy, move it along the rod, negotiate a 90 degree turn, and then eat it as a reward. And one simply de it measures how long it takes the animal to retrieve the lifesaver. Here are the results for the two tasks. For normal monkeys, monkeys with lesions limited to the hippocampus, and the larger medial temporal lobe lesion that includes the HM-like lesion of the hippocampus, amygdala, and underlying cortex. And what you see, as we've already, sort of already covered, is there's a modest deficit with hippocampal lesions and a severe, profound deficit with the larger medial temporal lobe lesion that reaches chance performance at 10 minutes. That is, the monkeys are doing as if they flipped a coin to determine their choice. They have no memory of the object after 10 minutes. In sharp contrast, the motor skill learning has a different story altogether. There's six trials a day, uh, eight daily se eight sessions, and testing after, one, after a month on two different days. The monkeys start off clumsily, they become more skillful at the task, and they get very fluent at retrieving the lifesaver in, in a mere five seconds. So what this is telling us is that the very same monkeys who can't remember the identity of an object for 10 minutes nevertheless show overnight retention of the skill and get better and better at it, retaining it perfectly after, after, a, after a month and performing all along as, 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 as well as intact monkeys. So what this and much other data has brought us to is this sort of overarching way of thinking about the organization of long-term memory in which we divide long-term memory into two major categories, declarative memory and non-declarative memory. Declarative memory is expressed through recollection and uh, it refers to our ability to learn new facts and to remember specific events. Non-declarative memory is an umbrella term that refers to a whole variety of different things, uh, all of which are in, intact in these patients and lie outside the province of the medial temporal lobe memory system. 
So we haven't, I haven't had a chance to, to time to give you examples of all, of all these things, but we're talking about skills and habits. Habits we know have a particular dependence on the neostriatum, the caudate nucleus, and the putamen. Uh, the phenomenon of priming is interesting in itself. It, uh, in the simplest form, priming refers to a phenomenon where if I showed you a picture of an object and I asked you to name it as quickly as possible, you would name it in about 800 milliseconds. If I came back a week later and you asked exactly the same question with the same size object and in the same orientation, you would name it in 700 milliseconds. You show 100 millisecond savings and that phenomenon is completely independent of whether you remember seeing it before. In fact, amnesic patients are fully intact at this phenomenon show front priming at full strength. Perceptual learning would be an example. For example, like in the mirror reading task, simple class conditioning, we can divide into two major categories. The learning of emotional responses, which depends on the amygdala. Uh, in the laboratory, we think of fear conditioning, which you'll be hearing about from Mark Mayford in a few minutes. Uh, in real life, you might think of something like the development of a phobia, uh, an experience-dependent phenomenon. Uh, in, in the case of conditioning of skeletal responses, uh, we, know, we know it depends on the cerebellum. In a laboratory, we think mostly of eye blink conditioning. In real life, you might think of something like bringing a motorcycle to a stop and negotiating appropriately the clutch and the brakes. Non-associative learning refers to phylogenetically early and simple kinds of plasticity like uh, habituation and sensitization that are well demonstrated in animals like uh, Drosophila and aplesia that haven't yet invented a hippocampus but nevertheless have a well-developed ability to change their behavior as a result of experience. So non-declarative memory then is experience-dependent behavior and in that sense it deserves the term memory. The performance changes without requiring any conscious memory content or in many cases even the, uh, the, uh, the feeling that memory is being tested. In fact, in many cases of non-declarative memory, uh, it's not experienced as a memory. I mean, declarative memory is either true or false. It's uh, either the fact that you have or the event you're remembering is true or it's false. Non-declarative memory isn't true or false. It's, it's, it's like saying uh, a habit isn't true or false. A tennis stroke isn't true or false. It's the way we are. It's our performance. Our, it's our dispositions to behave in particular ways. It's our attitudes, our, pred our predilections. So, as I conclude, I have the chance to say how grateful I am to have been able to grow up and do my basic research in this fine department with its long biological tradition, being mentored in the art of science by Sam Berendis, and being able to participate in the full neuroscience community here at UCSD. Thank you. <laughs> As with almost everyone who is giving a talk today and yesterday, uh, the, the, the uh, material that they have could be a full day, two days, but we ask them to do something that is extremely challenging, and it's to take your area of work, boil it down to 15 or so minutes, and do it in a way that a very bright audience, but with very mixed backgrounds, can understand. Uh, and that uh, we did that because, selfishly, we wanted to be sure we highlighted as many people as possible. But it does have a benefit to it, because what it does, and Larry certainly showed this, uh, what it does is it uh, it uh, forces you to focus in on, oh my God, I'd rather talk about, uh, I want to expand on X and Y and Z, but what's really important for this audience is, and everybody's done that. And uh, again, if I'd have had my druthers, we'd have had a five-day symposium here, and everybody would have had 30 to 40 minutes to talk. Uh, but uh, while that would have been my preference, there is a small additional benefit of having people have to give uh, focused 15-minute talks.